Once again, we greet you from the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. This is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be a real inspiration to every one of you. And you out in the radio listening audience, if you ask someone to tune in to WNGC, the big giant station here in Athens, where you're now listening, and get the hour coming up, I feel we can be a real inspiration. We appreciate our radio listening audience. We appreciate you here in the auditorium. We're hoping today that God will bless and warm every heart, not only in the auditorium, but also out in the radio listening audience. Now take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 12 for the reading of God's Word today. I'm going to speak on the subject, Why God Called the Rich Young Farmer a Fool. Now God called him a fool is a reason for it. I want to find out why God called him a fool. Now this message and the singing and the music, of course, will be on tape number 285. Tape number 285. You in the radio listening audience or in this auditorium would like to have a copy of this message and music today, then just call for tape number 285. Found for a gift of $3 each, and the gift is you to help defray our radio expense. Now, we heard on the air, of course, each day at 12 o'clock noon. That is Monday through Saturday, and from 11 to 12 on Sunday. And we'd like to hear from you. Now, during these days of vacationing, when a lot of people are getting their vacations, I'm glad they're able to get a vacation. It's helpful to anyone to be able to get a vacation away from their jobs and rest for a week or so or take a little trip. And, of course, during this particular time, people get busy. They seem to forget about a faith of min a ministry of faith. And so I want you to pray for me and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. Now, you can get these tape by number or by title. And if you'd like to have a list of our cassette tape, we'd be glad to send you a list at your request. We have some 260-some are listed, and you can choose the ones that you desire. Now, in Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. There will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said unto him, Thy fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Now I want you to take a look at verse 20. But God said unto him, Thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Now when God calls a man a fool... You know the man's a fool. Now there's a reason for God doing that. I want to find out what that reason is. Now I don't think God called this man a fool because he was a farmer. Because some of the greatest people that dwell on this earth today are farmers. In fact, when God started man out after he expelled Adam from the garden, he kept the garden and then God expelled him from the garden. And they, of course, tilled the soil. And uh, they started out in the country, so to speak, of farming and tilling the soil and raising sheep and taking care of vineyards and things of that type. God didn't call this man a fool because he was a farmer. I grew up on a farm back in the days when I was a young boy in my early teens. They called the Hoover days. Back in those days, we hardly could get enough money to have money to spend for anything. We lived in uh, poverty. We were so poor back in those days until the poor people called each other poor. And it was kind of rough in those days. Uh, people were too poor to pay attention. They were too slow to catch a cold. And the soil was too poor to raise your voice on. But many of those people could plow a straight furrow. And they were good plowmen. They could all go from one end to the other and plow that straight furrow. Now, I thank God for people that can do that. 
There's a man that died one time, and on his tombstone, he was such a great preacher, that had on his tombstone, he plowed a straight furrow. Now, if we can do that, we would do well. Now, God didn't call this man a, farmer, a fool because he was a farmer. God didn't call him a fool because he was a rich man. Nothing wrong in being rich, provided you get your money honest and be able to give God his part and help those who are in need. Nothing wrong in that. We have more millionaires in America today than the history of the world's ever known. We have millionaires coming into existence every day in America. And then, of course, God didn't call him a fool because he was a rich man in the Bible. You have some rich men. Abraham was a rich man. Solomon was a rich man. Many rich men recorded in the Bible. God didn't call them fools because they were rich. Now, if you get your money honest, give God his part and help take care of the need of others, then uh, God wouldn't call you a fool if you were a millionaire, billionaire, providing you get it honest and straight and do that which is right. Now, God didn't call this man a fool because he was a hard worker. Now, we're living in a day whenever uh, people um, like to get by without working, uh, without earning a living. They're going to rob and steal and kill and, and, and try to get what they want or desire from others without having to work for it. But this man was a hard worker. Nothing wrong in that. God meant for men to work. God said, six days shall thou work, and on the uh, Sabbath shall thou rest. Now, nothing wrong in working. Now, you can't overdo it. You need to rest at least one day out of a week. Now, you need, Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to come apart and rest a while. And if you don't come apart and rest a while, you will come apart eventually. And so you need to come apart occasionally and rest a while. You can't go seven days a week, day in and day out. And expect not to wear out. You're so, most certainly going to wear out and fold up one of these days. You've got to kindly take care of yourself in that respect. God gives you common sense enough to know that your body can take so much. But nothing wrong in working. We're living in a day whenever it's shocking to see how well parents mind their children. Now there used to be a day when we were growing up that we did a little work around the house. The little girls washed the dishes and swept the floor and made up the beds and the boys did the chores around the house, milked the cows, fed the pigs, the chickens, and worked on the farm. But today you have to pay your young uns to get some work done. Now back in those days, that was something I never heard tell of. You have to pay your young uns to get some work done around the house. You got to pay them to cut the grass or tend the garden or whatever, or milk the cows. You got to give them a quarter for milk the cows and so forth. But in those days, we didn't have any money, so I guess that's the reason we didn't get paid for what we did. Now, we felt like we was part of the family. We had to help make the living, and we didn't expect any payout of it. The old hen laid enough eggs. We might go to the store a lot of part of the week and have a few eggs left over from what mother wanted to get sugar and coffee and buy a little maybe candy or something, but that's about it. But to now, you got to hire your young'uns to work. That's pitiful. Now, working is good for your children. Now, if you want to give them something for what, there's nothing wrong in that. But if you have to come right out and hire them, and they're not going to work, and unless you hire them, you're getting in bad shape. And so you need to realize that if you want to give them something for doing some chores, nothing wrong in giving them a little gift and appreciation. Now, this man was a hard worker. And if we had more people today working for a living, we'd have less crime and less devilment going on in the land. But we're living in a day when people are not going to work. I mind, mind of the old man is dirty and nasty and filthy, and laid down under a tree, hadn't took a bath in, in months, and uh, flies covered the top of his head. He, he is too lazy. He wasn't going to run them off, so he just let them stay up there. And old yellow jacket lit on top of his head and stung him right in the middle of the top of his head. He reached up and said, all right. Said, there's always a smart aleck in every crowd and for that every last one of you can get off. Now that's the only way you could get some people to do anything. Let a yellow jacket sting in the top of the head. They might uh, run them off with that. But otherwise, they'll just let the flies stay there. Now we're living in a lazy age when people are going to loaf and look at TV. I'm talking about many times young people 
And they don't want to work, don't want to do anything. And working is good for your children. Now, if you think they're too good to work and you think you shouldn't make them work, there's something wrong with you. Now, working is good for them. And they need to do some work and train them to work. And they'll appreciate that later on in years. As a young boy growing up, time I was big enough to carry a milk bucket to the uh, cow barn and milk the cow, I started milking cows and tilling the, tilling the farm and picking cotton and peas and things of that type. I'm glad I did. I appreciate that in those days. And this man was a hard worker. God didn't say, didn't say he's a fool because of that. Now, God did not call this man a fool because he took care of what he had. Nothing wrong in being saving. Now, a lot of people squander away and throw away more than it takes for some families to survive on. Did you know that's one of the greatest sins in America? Wasting and throwing away. Did you know we throw away more food in America than it would take to feed many nations? Did you know that? People yonder in India and Africa and various other parts that were starving to death, nothing to eat, and we just throw it in the garbage can, just dump her out. Dump it out by the millions of pounds of food every day and people starving all over the world. We need to be saving. Don't throw away your food. When you go to table to eat, don't take more on your plate than you can eat. Take what you can eat and, and be saving. You don't necessarily have to be a tight wad, but you can be careful and saving in what you have. You may say, preacher, you had got in the Bible for that. I sure have. When Jesus fed the multitude, he said to the apostles, take your basket and take up all that's left over. Don't throw anything away. Take it up, put it in the basket. And that they did. And I think it's a sin to waste and squander and throw away the food and the blessings God's given us. There may come a day when we don't have to pay for that. Be glad to get a little food to eat. You can't ever tell. And so don't throw away. Don't waste what you have. Be saving. Now, God didn't say he was a fool because he took care of what he had. That was all right. Now, why did God call this man a fool? Number one, he was self-centered. He thought only of himself. In verse 17, he thought within himself. The letter I is mentioned six times, and my is used five times in the scripture. He was a self-centered man. He's very selfish. Now, he cared for no one but himself. Now, you have some people that pray like this. They say, Lord, bless me and my wife, my son, my daughter is for and no more. Well, that's just, well, all they care about. Uh, just your own little immediate family. Now, we need to be concerned about others. Now, this man was self-centered. He wanted everything for himself. That's what he wanted. We find old Nabal in 1 Samuel chapter 25. He was a foolish man. He was self-centered. He wouldn't help David out, wouldn't give anything to his soldiers. And David protected his property and his goods. And he was a foolish man, a son of Belial. And he said, I'm not going to give David anything. There are always traps coming through here and they get nothing I have. And God didn't like, you know what happened? God let that old man pitch a drunk and kill him and give his wife to David. And she became the beautiful wife of David. Her name was Abigail, a very beautiful woman. The old selfish husband of her, so self-centered, so, such a tight wad and skint flint and nickel neighbor and penny pincher and he'd skin a flea for his hide and tallow. And God said, I'll take that old drunk and get rid of him and give his wife a good husband. And so God gave her his wife David for a husband, one of the greatest men that ever lived, the, the man David, the great king of Israel. And so he was self-centered. Old Nabal was self-centered and died drunk. And we find this man was self-centered. God said, you're a fool. Number two, the second reason God called him a fool is because he's not grateful to God. Not one time does he recognize God for his blessings. You can't find one place here, one time, where he bowed his head and said, Now, Lord, I want to thank you for what you've given me. That's one of our great sins today among Christians, among people in America. We live in the richest land in the world, have abundance here in this land, and people go on and think God owes it to them. Not one time did you ever stop to thank God for what they have. You should never sit down at your table and eat your food without first bowing your head and thanking God for it. You ought to thank God for the air you breathe, the water you drink, the clothes you wear. You ought to do that. Thank God for health. Thank God for living in America. Thank God for being a Christian. You ought to thank God every day for what you have. 
If you had to live in poverty like some poor people do in this world, you'd appreciate what you got. I've seen enough of that. I've traveled in World War II, saw it in World War II, saw it in my uh, tours to the Middle East, various places. I thank God for America, and you ought to thank God for it too. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, For I make you the sun to rise on the evil, on the good, and send his rain on the just and the unjust. That poor old cusser out there, that poor old sinner, that man out there today that pissed a drunk last night and lying there in the bed now with a headache about half mad because his wife's listening to this broadcast. Well, God gives that old man air to breathe and food to eat and water to drink. Didn't he done gone on to hell a long time ago? Now, God lets the sun shine on the unjust as well as the just. You need to realize that God lets you live and lets you breathe the good air Enjoy the good sunshine and, and see the beautiful handiwork of God. And yet you cuss, you take God's name in vain. You mean to your family, you fuss on your wife, you slap your children around, you never carry them to church. You're as mean as a devil. And yet God is letting you stay out of hell and you wonder why. Well, one of these days God may just let you loose and let you drop on in. Now you need to realize that God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance of long suffering, not knowing the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. If you begin to think about the goodness of God, you ought to repent. Get on your knees and tell God you're sorry you're so mean and ungodly and been so hateful and, and ignoring him and his Bible and the church and been mean to your family, won't carry your children to church and let them grow up and go out into crime, get in, the, in prison and chain gang and whatnot. You ought to ask God to forgive you for these things. Now, God didn't call this man a fool then because he, he, God called him a fool rather because he was not grateful to God, not one time to recognize God for his blessings. Now, the third reason God called him a fool is because he made preparation to take care of his goods and none for his soul. Here's a man, here so busy taking care of his goods. He said in verses 18 and 19, he said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods I will say to my soul, so thou as much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. This man said, I got it made. Man, I have abundance of food. I'll just tear down my old barns. I'll be a bigger one. I'll store my food up, and I'll just sit down and have a good time, eat, drink, and be merry. Man, I've got it made. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 36, Jesus said, What should it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul. If you gain this whole world and lose your soul, you're still the loser. The great Dr. George W. Truett, yonder in, in Texas many years ago, passed the First Baptist Church, walked on the outside of the church. The farmer came up and said, uh, uh, you, you preacher here? He said, yes, I'm uh, Dr. George W. Truett. He said, well, I don't introduce myself. He said, you see all this land in this direction? He said, yes. He said, that's mine. You see the land in that direction? Yes, that's mine. He pointed in every direction. So own land in every direction you see. Dr. Truett said, that's wonderful. He said, all right. How much you own in this direction? Man dropped his head. So well, I don't guess I own anything up there. Man wasn't right with God. He was a foolish man. He owned a lot of the world's goods, but nothing in heaven. Now, if you haven't laid up in the treasures in heaven, you don't own anything up there. You will hold up this world's goods and not laying up in the treasures in heaven. Then you're making a bad mistake. You need to realize that. Lay up something up there. You have people today, they can't hardly wait to get that ticket to rush to the bank. And they'll deprive themselves of things they need in order to stick that money in the bank. They want to get her in there. And let her draw the interest. Get her in there. And run, get her in there. And not one time to think about banking anything up there. You need to be banking something in heaven. Because one of these days when you come to die... The only thing that's going to really count in that hour is not what you leave behind. It's what you have sent on before, what you've laid up in heaven. What you have over there is what's going to count as far as you're concerned personally. You need to realize that this man didn't do that. He took care of his goods. He said, I need greater barns, bigger barns, and I'm going to store my goods up, and I'll have a big time from here on in. Number four... God called him a fool because he prepared for old age and not to die. Beloved, listen to me. There's nothing wrong in putting up a little nest egg if you have a nest egg to put up. That is, there's nothing wrong in putting up a little something for a rainy day if you're able to do something. Nothing wrong in that. 
That's all right. That's commendable because one of these days you're going to get old, disabled to work. And if you have a little nest egg there, you find your children will pay you visit more often. If you got a little nest egg there, you find your young ones will seem to think more of you. Wonder why. If you got a little nest egg there, they come to see you more often than they would if you don't have anything. Now, if you're just a liability and, and you don't have anything and they got to look after you and care for you, they might uh, not get around too often. I'm talking about the average person. I'm not talking about every individual. But if you're pretty well fixed, they, you, they'll be around to see you. They want to they wanna stick in there with mom and daddy because they got a nest egg back there. And one of these days, mom and daddy's going to leave that nest egg and, and they want to be sure to know where it is. Now, beloved, listen to me. This man here, he provided for old age, but he didn't provide for his soul. Nothing wrong in laying up a little for old age. You can pay for a little home, work all your life, pay for a little home, have to live in in your old age, well and good. If you have a little uh, farm that you have in your old age, good. If you got a few dollars in the bank, that's fine. Nothing wrong in that. That's good. That's wisdom. People love their bodies more than love their souls this day and time. This man said, I'm going to fix up now and got everything laid up. I'm going to enjoy it. When I'm old, I'll have plenty. We we'll have to worry about a thing. And we need to realize that parents today work for the physical welfare of their children, but not their spiritual welfare. If you as have concern about the spiritual welfare of your children, as you are their physical welfare, things would be different. Amos said in Amos chapter 4 and verse 12, prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. You got to meet God. Prepare to meet thy God. Reason number five that God called this man a fool is because he laid up treasures in the wrong place. It's all right to put a little money in the bank and add it in a place of keeping and draw a little interest. Nothing wrong in that. Uh, maybe if you got a, a little safe and put it in or ground squirrel a little now and then and keep it for rent. Nothing wrong in that. But don't, don't forget, you could be laid up in the wrong place. The best place to lay it up would be in heaven. If you really want to count at the end of the journey. In verse 21, so he that layeth up treasures for himself is not rich toward God. Jesus said, lay up treasure in heaven. Now, was the Lord just wasting words? Did God just say that just to be saying something? Or did God say that for your good? God said that for your good, and God said that for my good. Lay up treasures in heaven, said God. Now, whenever the offering place had passed this morning, some of you put your means in there. What were you doing? Let up treasures in heaven. And what you do for God, God keeps the record. God knows exactly. God knows every penny that you've ever given as a Christian. It's on the book. God's got your record. God knows exactly how much you give. It's right there. God keeps a record of that. And God will take care of that. It's a judgment seat of Christ. The sixth reason that Jesus called him a fool is because he presumed upon thee tomorrow. Look at verse 19. I will say to my soul, soul, thou as much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now he presumed upon tomorrow. He talked about what he's going to do tomorrow. What he's going to do out here in the future. The Bible says you don't have any promise of tomorrow. You can be out here in the mortuary tomorrow. If old Roberts don't come along and raise you from the dead, you can be out there in the mortuary. Understand he's been raising people from the dead lately. And I guess these um, morticians are kind of trembling and uneasy now because old Oral has raised some people from the dead and so has Richard seen him do it. Some of the biggest lies I've ever heard in my life. Anyway, uh, if uh, uh, you could be out there in the mortuary tomorrow, see, I could be out there. We need to realize that. And so be careful about it. Don't say I'm going somewhere tomorrow, the next day, or the next day. Just say the Lord willing, I'll do that. Proverbs chapter 27, verse, verse 1, Boast not thyself for tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day brings forth. There's an old man one time, he's going down to, to buy a cow. Met the preacher, and the preacher said, where are you going? He said, I'm, I got some money, and the man's got a cow down here, and I, I know what it costs, I'm going down to buy that cow. Well, the preacher said, you ought to say, the Lord willing, I, I, I'll go buy that cow. He said, I know, I know, I know what I'm going to do. I got the money, he got the cow. That sells it. I'm going to buy the cow. The preacher said, you ought to say, the Lord willing, you'll buy that cow. And he bid him to do it, and the man went on down the road. Before he got to the farm to get the cow, a robber jumped on it, beat him up, and took his money. 
And he had no money, no need to go on down to buy the cow, so he started to go back home. All the way back home, he met the preacher. The preacher said, well, neighbor, he said, where are you going? He said, I'm going home, the Lord willing. Now, it might pay us to say the Lord willing once in a while. You know what you're going to do tomorrow. You ought to say, I'm going to do thus and thus, the Lord willing. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, as he reads of righteousness and tempted and judgment to come, feed his trembling as to go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. As far as I know, Felix died and went to hell. He put it off too long. You need to realize you can't wait too late. And then this man, the seventh reason God called him a fool, is because he left God completely out of his program. Now you have a program where you realize it not, not, might not be well organized, but you have a, a routine, you have a program, you have things that you do and you plan to do day by day. Are you leaving God out of it? Are you taking God in on your program? Now here's a man here that completely left God out of his program. Left God, no time for God, no time for the church, no time for religion, just too busy, period. And when you get too busy for God and too busy to pray and too busy to read your Bible and too busy to go to church, you're just absolutely too busy, period. You need to realize that. And he left God completely out of his program. You'd do well to take God in on your program. The apostle Paul said, I die daily. Every morning he got up and, and after being beaten up and sore, maybe the night before where they thrown him in jail, he said, Lord, I, I'm going to crucify myself on you today and die out to Paul and live for Jesus today. He put God in his program every day, every morning. God was in his program and all day long. And so this man left God out of his program. Now God warned him about riches. God warns us all about that. And there's a danger in riches. The Bible says he that hastens to be rich is not honest. Now you mark this down and listen to me and let me have your ears and put your feet on the floor. You take a man that robs God, doesn't give God a portion of his income as he should, and he's striving to get every penny he can, and he's so stingy he can hardly walk, afraid he wears shoes out. That man uh, grabbed him for everything he can get to become more wealthy and get more money and get ahead of the Joneses. And if he knew how much the Joneses owed, he wouldn't want to try to get ahead of them. But he's trying to get ahead of the Joneses. Now God said that man will become dishonest. He's a dishonest man. You can't trust him. He liable, liable, you better button your Park it up where you got your wallet when you get around it. Don't, don't trust that man to He'll cheat you. He'll lie to you. He'll beat you. He'll steal from you every way he can because he's too, too hasty to get rich. And the Bible said he that hastens to become rich is not honest. Now, God, I'll tell you what God said. And if you don't like it, you argue with God, not with me. I'm, I, I'm just giving you the book. God wrote the Bible. I didn't write it. God just called me to tell you what he wrote. And that's what God wrote. He that hastens to be rich is not honest. And if you hasten to become a rich person, ignoring everybody else and running over people like a freight train, you become a dishonest person. I don't care who you are. And I have never yet developed in my 45 years of ministry, I've never developed a person to be a good Christian that robbed God with their finances. Never. It's impossible. They'll bog you down. You can't do it. You can't develop them. They'll never make a real good Christian until they come to the place where their heart's right with God and they give God their portion of the income that they should. Then you can get in and help them and make good Christians. Otherwise, you can't. Now, notice, last of all, this man had no consideration about his goods left behind. I like that song Brother Gibson sang, What Would You Leave Behind? Based on the scripture, verse 20. But God said unto him, Thy fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? What are you going to leave behind? In Psalms chapter 39 and verse 6, the Bible said, Surely every man walketh in vain, show, in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. The Bible said man heapeth up riches and don't know who's going together. Don't know what's going to happen to them. You need to kind of look back and do some things and sit down and wonder what's going to happen to what you leave behind. If you leave behind something that falls into evil hands and your youngs get in a fight and a fuss and a quarrel and go to court and won't speak to one another and die and go to hell over what you left, 
God's going to hold you partly responsible. You need to set her in order. Get her all lined up and know what's going to happen to what you leave behind. If you leave behind something that falls in the wicked hands and it's used for an evil purpose, God's not going to let you get by with that. You'll answer to God for that. You need to set your ducks in a row. And what you leave behind, you need to know which way it's going and what hands it's going to fall into. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying every last one of you ought to have a will made out. If you men don't have a will made out for your family, then, then you should get one made out. You're not treating your wife right if you don't have a will made out because if you die, she would know what to do, what's left behind, how to handle it. Then if she dies, what's going to happen to everything? People need to make out a will and make it out right. And then if it has to be changed, then change it. Like the old man got the earphones and his youngest didn't know he could hear anymore and he's living with them. Been wet them several weeks and went back to the doctor. The doctor said, well, what do youngins think about your earphones? He said, well, they don't know I got them. He said, in fact, I've changed my wheel about three times since I got them. And so you could uh, uh, maybe find out what's happening and what people are saying and know which way your wheel should go. Amen? Say amen, owe me one. You know I'm telling you the truth. All right, that's fine. I'll tell you this in closing. That's an old man one time. He's a wealthy man. And he had a foolish fellow working for him. Fellow's kind of goofy. And this uh, wealthy man took an old crooked stick and said, I uh, uh, said, you ignoramus, said, I want you to take this old crooked stick and everywhere you go, you take your thing with you until you find a person that's a bigger fool than you are and then you give him that stick. Yes, sir, he took the stick. And he kept it with him and day in and day out. One day his master became seriously ill. And uh, he was on his dying bed, and he sent for the old servant. And the servant went in, and the master, he said to his master, said, Master, sir, the, uh, I understand you're seriously ill. He said, yes, I'm seriously ill. He said, understand that to tell you you don't have long to live. He said, that's right, servant. I sure don't. And he said, Master, servant, I understand now that you're not ready to die. You're not saved. You not, haven't prepared to meet God and your lost man. And you're going to die very soon. He said, yes, sir, that's right, servant. That's sure right. He said, you take this stick. You're the biggest fool I've met since the day you gave it to me. A manly.